In this video, I will conclude this three-part series on data screening and cleaning by talking about how we check our outcome data for normality. Um, as you may understand and realize that many or all parametric data analysis techniques like the t-test or an ANOVA have as one of their assumptions that the outcome data that's being used have to be normally distributed. And so that's our, kind of our last step in this process is to once we've determined our data is complete, once we've determined our data is accurate, we now want to assess it for normality. Um, and so the primary way we do this, and there are several ways, is we can run descriptive statistics. Um, and part of that output will be a skewness score. And skewness can be either positive or negative, um, but the skewness score gives us an idea of how much uh, our data might deviate from normal. Now, obviously a perfectly normal distribution would have a skewness score of zero um, as that value gets larger away from zero in a positive value, um, the more positive skew there is, is the value becomes more negative, that the more negative skew is present. Um, the larger that value is, the more skew there is, or the more that data deviates from the normal distribution. And so we typically will use this skewness score as a very quick and easy way to determine um, if our data is normally distributed. Now, one of the more common rules that we use relative to the skewness score to determine normality is known as the rule of one. So if the skewness score for our data is between minus one and plus one, then we can consider that to be normally distributed. If the skewness score is greater than positive one or less than negative one, so if it's one negative 1.5 or positive 1.5, we would consider that to be uh, a skewness that's large enough that our data would no longer be considered normal. And so that's one of the more common and one of the easier ways to determine normality of data, and that works in, in most situations. If we want to be a little more stringent, we can use some of the um, more common normality tests that are out there, like the Shapiro-Wilk um, is a common one, to determine if our data is normally distributed or not. But for the most part, most people use the rule of one, especially if we're working with um, research that's not particularly high stakes, um, and we've got random sampling, we can be pretty self-assured that most of our data is going to be normally distributed. Now, if we turn into a situation in which our data is skewed, um, and it's beyond our criteria, in this case, the rule of one, let's say, um, and we've already screened for accuracy, we've already screened for completeness, our next step is to determine if there are any outliers present. Um, very often an outlier, which is a score much different than the majority of the other scores, can actually create a skewed distribution. It can pull the mean um, in one direction or another away from the majority of the other scores as represented by the median. And so one of the things we can do, and when we have a skewed distribution, is first check for outliers. And I'll, I'll demonstrate how to do that here in a little bit. Um, and if we do identify outliers, and these could be actual accurate scores, but are very different from the rest of the scores, and by trimming them and removing them from the distribution, we can then normalize our distribution. Um, sometimes there are outliers and our data is still skewed, and that's when we need to look at non-parametric data analysis options. Or if we trim an outlier um, from our data set and our distribution is still not normal, then we may need to rely then on the non-parametric analysis techniques. So what I'm going to do is go into some data first and kind of identify the information that we need to determine if there might be outliers in a distribution. So here we are in Intellectus, and uh, what we've got here is we're going to be working with a variable known as reading number four. And we want to determine, we've already uh, determine that the data is complete. We've already determined that it's accurate. Um, and we now want to determine if it's normally distributed. And if it's not, you know, what are some potential options we might have? So to determine if it's normally distributed, we want to go to the analysis menu um, and we're going to choose descriptive statistics. And we're going to add that variable reading number four. Click confirm 
and then we click calculate. And so what we can see here is the raw output, and this is where we're going to find the information that we need. And we can see here the mean, the standard deviation, the number we have, the minimum, maximum scores, and then we look at the skewness score. And we can see here we have a skewness score of minus 2.5. Now this means we have a negative skew to our distribution of scores, and this value also exceeds that rule of 1 because it's beyond minus 1. And so we can conclude at this point that we have a negatively skewed distribution that's beyond um, what's acceptable to be considered normal. Remember, normality is, is relative. Um, we will rarely find a distribution of scores that have a skewness score of zero. Uh, so we use this rule of one as a way to still allow us to have distributions that have a slight skewness and still consider them normal, and that's appropriate then to use for inferential statistical analysis. So in this case, we've got a skewness score that's beyond our, our acceptable range uh, of minus one plus one. Um, and so the next thing we want to do is look for potential outliers that could be creating this skewness. And so we're going to need uh, a couple of pieces of information. And, and so when we have this, this output, we want to kind of track this down. So the first thing we want to look at is the minimum score. And the minimum score in this distribution is 22.1, as you can see here. And the maximum score is 100, which makes sense because the feasible range of scores in this using this tool is 0 to 100. So we want to know those two pieces of information. The next two pieces of information we need are the raw scores, the scores within our data set associated with the first quartile or the 25th percentile. And in this table here, we can see the 25th percentile or first quartile, quartile is associated with a score of 81.63. So we want to track that. We want to write that down. And then we want to find the raw score associated with the 75th percentile or the third quartile. And we follow that over there and we can see that that value is 92.48. So we want to write that down as well because we're going to need these four values to then make a determination if we have a skewed distribution. And so one of the things that helps us kind of visualize um, what we're going to be doing here as far as finding a distribution um, would be to draw a, a bell curve. And so we know that the middle of our distribution is marked by the median value, which is the most frequent, frequently occurring value. And we know that the, the frequency then of other values tapers off at either end of the bell curve. So what we're going to do is establish a boundary to say that if a score falls below this certain boundary, then it will be considered an outlier. If it falls above a boundary that we're going to set, then we would consider that to be an outlier. So we could have outliers at the lower end of the scale or at the upper end of the scale. And so we're going to set these two boundaries to say if scores fall below the lower boundary, it's an outlier. If scores fall above the upper boundary, we consider that then to be an outlier. So let's go back and look at the formula we use and the values that we just collected to then determine what our boundaries are. For, for outliers, and then we'll use the data we actually have to determine if we have any outliers. And so in order to identify these outliers, we're going to use a technique called the outlier labeling technique. And this allows us, as I mentioned before, to set up these boundaries to help us determine if scores within our data set would be considered outliers. Now, there are several criteria uh, that are out there as far as what's considered an outlier and what's not. And most of them are based around the number of standard deviations um, from the mean. So some definitions say that if, you're, if you have a score that's two or more standard deviations away from the mean, that's an outlier. Some say three or more standard deviations from the mean. Um, the outlier labeling technique kind of splits the difference there. And it uses um, the idea that anything beyond about 2.2 standard deviations from the mean would be considered an outlier. But it also uses the raw scores that we have, the distribution of scores, to make that determination. So it's, it's a little more complex way to look at it, but it also tends to be um, 
a little more accurate because it doesn't um, overestimate what an outlier is and, and trim our sample down smaller than we might want, or it doesn't underestimate an outlier either um, and create a, a greater skew that we might have. So there's a, a three-step process here in using the outlier labeling technique, and it does involve a formula um, and a little bit of um, calculation here, but it's fairly straightforward. So the first thing we're gonna do, step number one, is determine a value known as the interquartile range. And what we're gonna do essentially is take the raw score value associated with the 75th percentile, which we collected, and that was 92.48. And from that, we're gonna subtract the raw score value associated with the 25th percentile, in this case, 81.63. And that value is 10.85. And you can see I've got that uh, here in my formula. Now, the next step is to determine these boundaries for the outliers. And we actually have two formulas, one for the upper boundary for outliers and one for the lower boundary of outliers. And so what we're essentially going to do, and here's this formula represented in its, its basic format, is we're going to take the raw score associated with the third quartile, and to that, we're gonna add the interquartile range value multiplied by 2.2. And then for the lower boundary, we're gonna take the raw score associated with the 25th percentile, or the first quartile, and subtract that interquartile range times 2.2. So let's see how this would actually work with the data that we have. So we already determined that the raw score associated with our third quartile or 75th percentile is 92.48. We've already determined that our interquartile range is 10.85. And so we plug those values into our formula, 10.85 times 2.2 plus 92.48 equals 116.35. So that is beyond our feasible range. So we know that we don't have or shouldn't have any values that would be considered upper boundary outliers because our highest possible score we can have using this tool is 100. That won't always be the case, but that's our upper boundary. So if we have theoretically any values in our data set that are greater than 116.35, we can consider them to be an outlier. Now for the lower boundary, we take our raw score associated with the first quartile or 25th percentile, and that's 81.63. And from that, we subtract this product of the interquartile range in 2.2. So 10.85 times 2.2 minus, or subtracted from 81.63 equals 57.76. So this is our lower boundary. So if we have any scores in our data set that are less than 57.76, we could consider them to be an outlier. And so, if we, again, have any outliers that are present, we typically would trim them. Now, if we have less than 5% of our variable um, having outliers, or less than 5% are considered outliers, we can trim them and have really no problem with that. It won't appreciably affect our ability to then do um, inferential statistics. And it will presumably then help us normalize the uh, skewness or normalize the distribution of scores. Once we've trimmed those outliers, we can then reassess this data for normality and see if it meets our rule of one. So now knowing we have these two boundaries, 116.35 and 57.76, let's go back to our data in Intellectus and see if we have any outliers. So here we are back with our, our data. And remember, we have a lower boundary of 57.76 um, as being our boundary for potential outliers. So again, if we have any values less than 57.76, then we would consider them to be an outlier. And we can see we have a minimum score in our distribution of 22. So that means there's at least one score that we would consider to be a lower boundary outlier. Now the upper boundary for our outliers is 116, and we know that our max score is 100, so we don't have any upper boundary um, outliers. So we know we have at least one lower boundary outlier.
So let's go back into our data and let's find it. So we can click on management and that'll take us back to our data. Um, the best way or the easiest way to find that outlier would be to uh, use our option here to uh, organize the data so it goes from lowest to highest. So we're gonna go ahead and click on those little arrows there. And we can see here, it's now organized from lowest to highest. And here's, here's that 22.1 value. And we can see that it is the only value that's less than 57.76. So we have one single outlier and we have 150 scores. So removing one score is not gonna make an appreciable difference in our ability to, to do any inferential statistics. So our best option here would be to trim this or basically delete it um, from the data set and then reassess and see if that fixed our skewness problem. So we wanna to go to edit data. Um, we'll go ahead and, and scale that again. And here's our 22.1. So we're gonna delete that. And we're gonna click save. Okay, and so now we've got our uh, data here set up. And so now we can reassess this data and see if we fixed our normality problem. So we're gonna go back to the analyses menu, go to descriptives and choose that reading number four that we just uh, edited, click confirm, then click calculate. And we can see here now some new descriptive information. Um, and if we can look at, and so here's the first one we did when we had our skewness score of minus or 2.5. We had a mean of 86, and we can see that the mean, after we removed that single score, didn't really change very much. The standard deviation did change. It got a little smaller. And now we can look at the skewness score. And now we still have a negative skew, but it's much, much smaller. That's well within that minus one, plus one range of, of acceptable. So we could now state with this smaller skewness score that our data is now normal, normally distributed, um, and we can we deem it now appropriate to move forward to do parametric statistics like a t-test or an ANOVA. So hopefully you can see how we brought kind of all three parts together. We first uh, determined if we had complete data. Do we have all the data points that we expected? Do we have accurate data? Does it fall within our operational definition of what is a a, an appropriate score. And then lastly, we looked for normality of the data. And if we had a skew, we looked at a very simple technique for identifying outliers and then dealing with them. So now with those three steps, those three parts of the process completed, we now have accurate, complete data that's normally distributed and ready to be um, analyzed using different types of inferential statistics. So hopefully you found this video to be useful um, and good luck using it in your own research.